Good evening and welcome back to another live episode of Red Tinted Glasses here on the Red Tinted Glasses YouTube channel. It is episode 250 and yes, I'm all alone for those of you tuning in on YouTube initially, but fear not, maniacs of the world, I know you're tuning in ready to go. Phil Mayer will be joining me in just a second. Those of you that are tuning in on audio may notice a difference because over the international break, whilst the club haven't done any signing in terms of a new manager, we have signed a deal with the Sports Social Podcast. So if you are listening on audio, you might have heard a couple of adverts pre-episode and then you might hear some at the end. There will be um, an advert placed around about the 20 minute half an hour mark but it'll be at a suitable point so I won't stop speaking halfway through and the advert will be in but it's given us a chance to grow our podcast on an audio platform as well as seeing such a good growth here on YouTube as we're just a couple of subscribers away from 1,900 as well but without further ado I will introduce the man many are here to see tonight and have been longing to see back Phil Mayer, welcome back to Red Tinted Glasses, the able How deputy returned. <laughs> How is it going, Glenn? How is it going? Good, thank you very much. How are you? I'm all right. Here to please the mayor and the axe as ever. Good. I'm sure they'll be delighted um, to have you back on the show. On tonight's show, we will look back at the events at Fir Park as the Dons um, won a crucial three points pre-international break. Um, the advanced stages of that managerial appointment keep keep dragging on, so we'll discuss the latest around that. And of course, the big game coming up this weekend at Petodrias Ross County visit. Phil, as I said, big three points for Aberdeen pre-international break. 1-0 win. Controversy um, in there as well, which I'm sure we'll come on to. But just how important could that three points prove to be? I think it was was massively needed. I mean, it feels like it's an age ago now, um, you know, despite it only being the other weekend. But, but yeah, I think in the grand scheme of things, it's something we were needing. Our league form has been abysmal. I think we've said it for majority of the season. Um, you know, we sort of, I guess you could say, fluke, fluked our way at the three points, um, <laughs> or at least that's what Motherwell fans would would like us to believe. But um, but yeah, no, it felt good to finally get three points in. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, it it wasn't pretty and, uh, you know, we speak about the rub of the green not falling Aberdeen's way. Uh, I, you know, certainly looked at it's maybe been favouring us in the Scottish Cup, but it's about time it, it favoured in the league. And I think the fact that Ross County picked up an impressive um, win as well made our win so much more important um, as well ahead of obviously what's turning out to be a huge game this weekend. Yeah, well, I think that was one of the big things. I mean, we've sort of thrown away points when results have gone our way. So it's mm-hmm. um, it's quite nice for us to pick up points, you know, to, to sort of keep off the pressure when other teams' results are um, are going the way they need them to. So, yeah, overall, it just feels, just feels nice to actually feel like we've got a couple of wins under our belt, like in a row. Yeah. It's and a difference. I, and I suppose for... Um... Peter Levin continues his unbeaten reign as Aberdeen <laughs> interim manager. Uh, we're we're going to be in the same position as Robson again, aren't we? He's going <laughs> to he's going to pull off a miraculous end to the season. We're going to have never interviewed anyone, and we'll be in the same position as we were. Hey. Well, I, I suppose the the cynics will say, um, or certainly Willie Miller would say, is why didn't we just stick with him instead of spunking all that money on Neil Warnock? Well, it's it, it's one of those things. I don't think you could. Have, you know, hindsight's a, a wonderful thing. If we knew that the run under Warnock wasn't going to improve, no one can really predict whether it was going to be the same under under Leaven. Um, so at least at least it gave us something. You know, we got got a little bit of Twitter fun for a little minute. Yeah. Um, takeaways from from the Motherwell game. I don't want to spend too much time looking back on a game that maybe some people have already forgotten about. Leighton Clarkson getting a goal. I'm sure that'll do his confidence. The world of good boy and Miofsky again involved in the build up. Probably for his confidence. Uh, uh, unlucky with the shot um, coming in off the post. But of course, the international breaks provided boy and the chance to get on the score sheet for his national team. So I'm sure he'll be coming back to Cormac Park full of confidence, ready to go this weekend. Oh, definitely, yeah. No, like I say, it was good to see Leighton um, getting a goal. Um, 
I think he's slowly coming more into the player that we know him to be. Um, I think it's taken him a while to get to that point. I think you know the fact that he is maybe getting the, the freedom to play a little bit further forward these days under the, mm-hmm. the new sort of sort of system. Well, not even new system, but just changing that sort of five in the midfield um, seems to be suiting him a bit more. Um, yeah, like you say, it'd be nice to see Boyan getting back on the score sheet. Cause I think that's what seven. Is that seven games out of goal from now, or six? I think it's since certainly since feels like since Neil Warnock said he could get thirty goals a season, he hasn't yeah. scored. <laughs> yeah. I think I think cause I think I did hear. I think it was whoever was on the red TV conference. I think was saying that was his longest, like equal his longest goal drought for mm. us. So I think it was six or seven games, and it's been nice to see him get get back on the score sheet. Um, hopefully against County, but it's nice to also see him see him fire one in for 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 Macedonia um, the other day. Yeah, um, good to see that. Um, you all keep, keep me right. Um, Scott McLennan saying I'm not counting Dundee away because, of course, Peter Levin lost that game, so his, his run is not uh, unbeaten uh, as in Drim. But um, it, I, I guess another key takeaway from the, the game pre international would have been the fact that we kept a, a clean sheet, um, mainly thanks to VAR, of course. Um, but I'm sure something that, that not only Kyle Roos will take forward, but uh, Angus McDonald and, and Stefan Garterman as well, because there's been question marks over both of them as individuals, as a partnership, but these things take time and a clean sheet can only um, boost their confidence. Definitely. I mean, I think um, it's been one of our, our wobbliest points um, this season is just, just how, not even just the fact we're shipping goals, I think it's the fact we're shipping cheap goals um, for the most mm-hmm. part. So it was, it was quite nice to see us somewhat have a little bit of organisation um, at the back. Um, so yeah, hopefully... Like I say, I mean, I think Roos still has a long way to go to get back up in the estimations of a lot of um, a lot of fans. Hopefully, this sort of gives him a lot of more confidence to not be as flappy as he has been of late. Um, and it's the same with Gartman as well. I mean, if I ever see him get stuck under a long wall again, I mean, <laughs> pull my hair out and resemble you a little bit, Glenn. As I say, at least you can do that. Um, oh, I've totally forgot what I was about to say now. Um, oh, that's going to annoy me. Uh, this is the joys of doing a, a live podcast. Um, looking ahead to the the managerial, oh no, I know what I was going to say now. Um, in, in terms of the Motherwell disallowed goal, um, thoughts around that in general, I guess from an Aberdeen point of view, we'll we'll take it and take it and run. Just once again, <laughs> highlighting the the inconsistency of of VAR and, and the decisions, and I guess. Obviously, from an Aberdeen point of view, being an Aberdeen podcast, we're, we're delighted that that decision and, and the Graham Shinney decision kind of goes in our favour. Any complaints from you as a general Scottish football fan at, at the decision to, to rule out Motherwell's equaliser and then the, the Shinney handball at the end? Because for me, the, the one at the end, I certainly feel that I feel we pretty much got away with both, actually. Yeah, I think that's one of the things, and uh, you know, if you'll pardon the pun from taking my red tinted glasses off, boy. <laughs> um, I think you know, if if I'm just looking at it objectively, and if I was, you know, like I say, a fan of Motherwell, you would be you'd be raging. But it, it's one of those things where so many of them have kind of gone against us this season. Um, you know, we've had handballs not given, we've had questionable offside goals, and you know, this, that, and the next thing that. <sighs> it's almost law of averages that we're bound to have, you know, a controversial goal sort of chalked off in our benefit. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think, uh, yeah, objectively looking at that, I think you're, you're right. And you're saying we sort of got away with both of them. I mean, like you say, it's, it's, it's the inconsistency that's the frustrating thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, obviously not for us in this scenario, but in, in general, that's, that's the problem with, with VAR that everybody's brought up this season is that, you know, you wouldn't mind if it was the case for every single team, but it just seems to be that it's for a select few, really. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think as as Kettlewell pointed out, the fact that you know it wasn't a handball off the player that that scored the goal was the, the biggest frustration because they've been on the receiving end of a very similar decision against, of course, Aberdeen's opponents this weekend, and it'll be interesting to see if we are the subject of any VAR decision in what is going to be a huge game for both sides coming into this weekend and this is when it becomes season defining literally um to to clubs and these these sort of decisions but we were told um when Neil Warnock walked away from the club um walked away resigned 
stepped aside, whatever adjective you want to choose. Like no, the wheel. I, yeah, yeah, the wheels fell off. Um, the, that an appointment was imminent. Um, and I think, quote unquote, from the club statement that talks were at an advanced stage. Um, but we're no further forward uh, in seeing a, a, an appointment at, at the club. The club, whether it's to be believed or not, maybe have missed out on a couple of opportunities. Um, managers have turned the club down. It depends what, what rumour you want to believe it at, at this stage. One rumour, of course, that seems to be gaining momentum all the, all the more, especially with Northern Ireland being in Scotland, is, of course, Michael O'Neill. What's your thoughts on, on Michael O'Neill as a, a potential new Aberdeen manager? I think that sums it up pretty well. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to say. I mean, I, I don't, I, I can't say I've, I've watched Northern Ireland too much to even know what his style of football is. Just off the bat of it, I think, because we all kind of whipped ourselves up in a frenzy of who it could be, it seems like it's a little bit of a sort of meh option. Um, mm. I've no doubts that if he came in and started romping teams 5-0, I would quickly change my tune. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think it's just one of those things where I think I, I, I'm, I'm in the camp of hopefully bringing in somebody that's really got nothing to do with um, sort of British or, or Scottish football as much as um, I think it was, was uh, Richard Gordon was coming out and saying mm. that they had to have a knowledge of of the Scottish game, or there had to be a Scotsman and then proceeded to pitch Neil Lennon and Stephen Robinson and um, I can't remember, Tony Doherty, I think was the third one. Um, we, cer- we certainly seem to be liking the Northern Irish link with, with of course, yeah. O'Neill, Robinson and Lennon um, r- r- right now. I, I guess, obviously, comment on screen for those watching. Um, Paul Donaldson saying that he's okay with O'Neill except for a couple of things. Number one is, can we afford to pay off the, the Northern Ireland Football Association and he says today in his press conference as well that when he left um, Northern Ireland for Stoke, the, the Irish FA were, were very well compensated. Um, and I know from speaking to a couple of people that the compensation package that Northern Ireland are looking for has been something that has initially put off the club. Whether that's something that we've gone back at and are bargaining on, negotiating with, I, I don't know. But having spent so much money on Neil Warnock to to fail ultimately, can we afford a second big payout for a manager that we don't know what will bring? Um, Paul also goes on to say, of course, our past record of appointing former players as managers hasn't also been great either. Um, And I know it's been picked up as well, a a lot of Michael O'Neill's personal issues that, that come as well. Um, I, I'm not going to try and go down and shame him for stuff he's done. You know, the drink driving is obviously a concern to some fans, and you know the ethos matching that up with the the club as well. Would any of the kind of off the field issues for you affect our managerial choice? Uh, it depends, really. I mean, like like we're sort of mentioning with O'Neill here, I think the compensation is the biggest one. Um, you know, the the money that. You know, international managers are on, and they're usually on pretty lengthy deals. Um, especially when they've sort of had the success in Northern Ireland that he's had, would be a pretty big buyout. Um, and if we're willing to spend that buyout, it's a little bit worrying because it, I mean, we're we're almost definitely going to have a big turnover again uh, in mm-hmm. the summer. Um, you know, we're going to be try to build a new squad almost effectively. Um, especially you know if we sell, do end up selling some of our big hitters like like Miofsky and. And Duke and whatnot, um, so it is a bit of a concern. Um, you know, as much as we want to be spending a good bit on a manager to sort of utilise the money that we're spending on the pitch, I think it's something, especially after the Warnock saga, that we've kind of got to be a little bit wary of. Mm-hmm. Um, but as for like personal issues, you know, I mean, it's it's the same way as people have often used the jail jail stick to beat down David Martindale. You know, it's. Mm. You know, there's only so much you can you can hold over somebody. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, we're all football fans who, when results are going well, will quickly forget it. It will be when results are going bad that we'll we'll point at them as a factor. So, yeah, no, we didn't we didn't bother me. Yeah, and I suppose I, I was kind of having this discussion with Stewie Walker on on Twitter and a couple of other people, and he said, you know, that at the end of the day, if if the results on the pitch are, are positive, then people aren't really going to care about what he's done previously it'll only be brought up when 
things aren't going right. I, I suppose Andy Wright makes the, the comment about his rec- current record um, at, at Northern Ireland. He says, um, hasn't he lost nearly every game? N- no thanks for, for me. And again, that's something else listening to his pre-match press conference for the game tomorrow night at Hamden said, you know, he knows that his first 12 months in this current spell in charge of Northern Ireland has not been great and things will need to improve for the second 12 months. So <clears throat> it's also a youthful squad he's got currently at Northern Ireland. Um, again, a huge overhaul from some of the, the, the past gone eras of, of Northern Irish football. So he's got used to working with younger players. But again, for me, that record is something that, that puts me off um, personally. And for me, again, Michael O'Neill would be an extremely underwhelming appointment. Um, Ewan Grant, of course, who was doing co-hosting duties on the last episode, saying that he thinks O'Neill's a safe enough appointment. It's meh. Not expecting big things, but importantly, it's not a continuation of the Omni shambles. I, I, I think another point that made me laugh as well, seeing a couple of folk debate whether or not he was going to come in, saying if his name was like Mikhail O'Neillio, folk would be lauding him and being excited for him to come in. It, it's the fact that he's a, a standard British manager that I think you're right. I think there's a lot of us wanting to to break the grain and, and, and go out and, and get a, a, a fresh approach, uh, as Kaiser says, in, in going in the, that continental route. Comes with risk, but potential rewards, as we've seen when we've exploited that in terms of the players on the transfer market. Yeah, and I think that's... I mean, that's one of the things as well. It's We've always tried to pitch ourselves in the past sort of decade, a club that's trying to break the normal cycle. You know, we've tried to split the top top two. We've, you know, tried to do something and get in Europe. We've tried to, you know, bring in like a, a sort of very sort of standy player trading model and whatnot. And I, and I don't know why we're not willing to put that into the managerial search as well. I mean, um Really, I mean, it's what do we have to, to to lose? Really, they they perform kind of badly. We got a new manager. We've done that for the past three years now. So it, it's you know it's no different to what we've been doing. It's not like we've you know if, if we're in a period where we had decades and decades of stability and consistent success, and all of a sudden went right, we're going to appoint this random Kazakhstan under 17s youth football manager mm-hmm. because he plays a three at the back and possession football or whatever. You know, it's. It's nothing too out of the ordinary other than a name and maybe some ideas that are just hoofball and lucky strikers. Yeah. And, you know, speaking back to the compensation that, that Michael O'Neill could could come with, Barry Reid saying, if we're willing to pay that sort of money for a manager, which I think we need to, is what he says, um, I wouldn't be spending it on O'Neill. So, again, probably a point that some people would pick up on if we're willing to spend a lot of money on a, a compensation package for Michael O'Neill, could we be pushing the boat out for other managers out there within that sort of remit? Um, again, obviously, the, the Aberdeen rumour mill was going into overdrive at the fact that Darren Ferguson was staying at the Village on, on, on Saturday night, not just maybe the fact that he was up visiting friends, who knows, but we're at that point. I was at Gary Neville's thing at the music hall a few weeks back and um ryan crichton who was hosting it said that you could see folks heads turning and phones coming out probably tweeting the fact that gary neville's an aberdeen is he the next aberdeen manager you know just that the simple sight of a footballer or, or someone related to, to football is is sending uh, aberdeen whatsapp and uh, and twitter into into overdrive at, at this moment in time but but before we get into the, the game coming up at the weekend i i guess you know it's pretty clear we're not going to see an appointment now on, on Monday night. Peter Levin looks set to take charge um, ahead of the weekend's game against Ross County. Would now be the best time to just leave Peter Levin to it between now and Saturday, given what's going on in terms of the importance of the result this weekend? Yeah, I think it, in my opinion, you should probably just leave him to it. I think it's but the importance of the game, you're trying to limit as much outside distraction on the squad as you can. Um, and, you know, you could look at it on the, on the flip side and say if there's a new manager coming in, well, everyone's going to be playing for a shirt. But, you know, we tried to argue that with Warnock and then it fell apart. So um, I would like to think it, it, if they weren't appointing them, a new manager basically bang, bang at the start of the international break, there's no point in appointing one right now. Um, 
you know, by all means, sign a contract and stuff, but just sort of leave him behind the scenes and then just ease into assess the playing squad and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's, I suppose it's the same as everyone's saying on Twitter. It's, it's a little bit concerning. You know, it seemed like when Warnock was gone, the new manager was, was there, you know, ink was on the, on the paper and ready to go. And the more it's gone on, the more it just seems like we were nowhere near having anyone signed like it just seems to have gone on too long at this point yeah and I guess we kind of we just want a bit of honesty from the board um it kind of makes the whole things kind of made us look a bit foolish whether that's the board the fans and everything else associated with the club right now but I think given how much is riding on the game uh, on Saturday I would certainly be happy to see Peter leaving remain in charge I don't think he wants the gig on a a full-time basis anyway but it's almost too risky to bring in a new manager in the next few days and see him almost rip up what's been put in place ahead of the game. And I, I kind of wonder as well if there isn't a, a managerial appointment between now and the weekend. Obviously, of course, again, playing on the Michael O'Neill factor is that could we see him come in on Wednesday after, of course, the game at, at Hamden tomorrow night? Is Could we appoint another manager, but they just take a watching brief for the game on Saturday because again lose that and it becomes squeaky bum time yeah and it, it's a I suppose it's the confidence thing as well you know if you've got a manager coming in especially if we do end up going down the route of a sort of young um, manager that's new to Scottish football maybe not used to the sort of hostility of what occurs with bad results you know if we if they're in before county and we get beat you know 2-0 it, it'll, instantly they'll have you know, everybody on their back, not even just us, they'll have the media, everybody sort of having little jibes at them. So I think it's probably safer for us just to sort of stick with with Peter at the moment. And to be honest, you know, after the Motherwell game, you might as well. You know, it's nothing too disastrous went on. Yeah, no, I would uh, pretty much uh, agree with that um, summary o- o- on Peter. And I guess a couple of other things just to pick up as we move into the, the Ross County preview is Scott M saying can I try and convince the head coach of Rijeka that the rain won't mess up his hairstyle too much um, I've actually got a new mattifying mo- moisturiser to try out um, to reduce the shine on the forehead so if that goes well I can maybe recommend that to him once he, if he comes over um, and obviously the game this weekend Phil huge game um, maybe folk feel we're building up too much I don't know but David McLaren saying if we win against Ross County we don't actually need to rush into an appointment given we would then produce a, a six-point gap, potentially seven given the goal difference, depending the way you want to look at it. Do you think a win on Saturday does give us a little bit more of a, a cushion to to take that time in appointing a new manager? Not really, in my opinion. I think we're wanting as much stability as we can. Because like this season's a write-off. We've all kind of agreed it's a write-off. It's mm-hmm. mainly just a staying up and seeing what we can potentially do in the Cup. Um, mm-hmm. So I think we need as much stability as we can going into next season. And I think that starts with getting somebody in sort of as soon as logistically makes sense. Um, you know, like, like I said, it's, we thought Warnock was going to be assessing the squad in full, which looks like didn't really happen. Um, but hopefully whoever whoever's in next, you know, it gives them the time to assess it, gives them the time to give the potentially new director of football um, a short list of players that would work under their system um, and really just get the wheels sort of turning on next year. Because um, this, this season really is just sort of dead at this point. Yeah, and I think kind of going back to what Warnick said is that any new manager needs time to assess the squad. So... I, I get where David's coming from in the fact we maybe don't need to rush into an appointment, but I would still like to see an appointment made before the end of the season so that they can come in and see what they've got and what needs added come the summer. Well, but you would, you would like to think as well that it's not really a rush because you would like to think that if the board had any sort of brain cell between them, um, that they, they would have been on the ball with looking for a new manager the minute that Robson went and they knew mm. that they were bringing in Warnock as an interim. So what would that have been now? probably close to <clears throat> is it well you're maybe about, well what since 
Robson left, or well, yeah. pretty much the same time anyway, isn't it? So it's about a month and a half. So yeah, but half, yeah. I mean, even even still, like we've said on the show as well about Robson's kind of writing was on the wall after Ross County in, in January. So the the long term vision, what is that from the club? Where is the kind of sight from the board? Were they just hoping Robson was going to magically turn it around? Were they hoping Warnock was going to wave a magic wand and things were going to be right? It almost just seems that they just put somebody in place and pray and hope for the best. And there's no kind of long-term planning. But there was a tweet today, and I guess kind of depending what way you are on the, the managerial situation, if you want us to rush, if you don't. Um, Kiza1903 tweeted out um, this morning, he says... I'm bored of our manager situation now. Not excited, optimistic, or even arsed, really. Uncertainty doesn't sell, and I suppose with the predicament our team is in right now in the league, it seems a right job getting anyone to say yes. And I think it's that apathy just now. The, the longer it's dragged out, fans, every time my name comes out, it's like, oh, well, that's not who I was hoping for, or, oh, well, it's not a unanimous kind of support for any potential new manager at this stage, but the uncertainty, as Kieran says, doesn't sell. And that starts this weekend because it's a, it's a huge game uh, as Ross County come to town. And a, a game, Phil, we absolutely must take three points in. Yeah, no, I mean, just going back to that initial point, I think it is apathy. And I think that's, we have said before, it's the overarching theme of this season. Um, mm-hmm. As we've all felt apathetic for far too much of it. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, I was out on Saturday, um, and I don't know if it's because I'm occasionally on here with you or what. Um, someone had came up and went, oh, "Phil, you're you're in the know. Who's the next manager?" I was like, "I couldn't even pluck. I couldn't even pluck a guess." <clears throat> I went, it, "Whoever I guess, it'll be miles away from it." Um, yeah. So it's at the point now where I can't even go. Oh, there's this random obscure manager in Norway mm. that's done all right because God knows who it'll be. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know if you're you're the same at, at work as being one of the the main token Aberdeen fans or the the, you know, the everyone. Who do you think is going to be the next manager? Who would your who would your choice be? I think I was asked that about twice today, and I, I honestly like I honestly couldn't tell you who I want to be the next manager, let alone who I think it would be, because there isn't a name currently that's not ruled themselves out that jumps out and makes me want to get behind them right now whoever it is you know ultimately will most likely get behind them I say depending who it is because of course Neil Lennon's still unemployed at this moment in time but right now no name gets me excited no and that was exactly what I was I was saying um on Saturday to the to the guys it was just sort of a thing where it was you know there's nothing really um, you know, I did see the old banding around Ronnie Dyla and it was like, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, I'll laugh to beat Celtic and I'm do the Ronnie Roar at our end handed. But at the same time, he struggled with a Celtic team, you know, because that was the season we should have won the league. Um, mm-hmm. He's clearly, like I said, I've not actually looked at Club Bruges' um, record for the season, but he's clearly not been up to par for them in a mm-hmm. league, which again is very much sort of dominated by two or three teams. Um, so... Yeah, there's no one. There's no one really that that sort of makes you rub your hands and go, "Oh, that would be like if we if we pulled that off, that'd be great." Um, and I think as well, it's because we know that anyone that's on that caliber is it's really probably career suicide almost when they come to us in this state. You know, we're we're <laughs> like we're like the UK at the Eurovision these days. You know. <laughs> oh, I can't wait for your tweets at Eurovision. It's nearly that time, Phil. What almost a time there. in your life! Almost there. Yes. Oh, that's going to be so much fun. But yeah, Ronnie Dial, it's, it's I, I mentioned the same thing uh, as well as work today. A Danny Ward recall and Lee Griffiths scoring dragged him to a league title, which he made look very difficult. Um, and obviously, Tom Rogic as well. Um, but even that name doesn't excite me and you know especially to, to go back to when people say oh just foreign managers are getting certain fans excited it's, it's it's not doing anything for me just now but I think it's as you say it's because of what he did at, at his time in Celtic you know at, the, at this rate Don Cowie if he comes down to Pataudry and wins folk will start touting his name <laughs> that's yeah. the, the nature of football no exactly exactly surprised Paul Hartley's not being suggested by Richard Gordon yet that's the biggest oh, shock I thought I don't know 
than a even temp fit. Um, looking ahead to the weekend, then, um, what do you think Peter Levin does in terms of a, a starting lineup for, for Aberdeen? It is it a, a lineup that goes out and, and takes the game to, to Ross County from the start? Of course, us being the home team, looking at Ross County themselves, they've sold out their initial allocation. I think this is also the first time we'll see the flexible away end, we'll call it. Um, section R is being being used as well for for home fans, so potential to see a, a big crowd from from both sides. Yeah, no, I think um, they'll be interesting to see who lines up. I think it'll be very much the same as has been with sort of four five one, um, and I can't really see there being much change in the team. Whether he maybe takes Baron out for the likes of Polvara, maybe, um, but I can see us being unchanged. I would like to think he's going to take it to. To, to county, um, because mm-hmm. county is one of those teams where they will just sit in, um, unless they concede, um, and then they'll sort of come out a little bit. So I think it's kind of vital to try and get off the mark quickly, um, because that I mean that's a game they want to come and play, especially in a game as sort of high stakes as as it's going to be. Um, so I would I would like to think even if we are just starting with one up front that we are kind of. Um, I mean, some of our players on the box against another one I thought was brilliant with um, mm. with McGrath and stuff. Um, so I would I would like to see us sort of try and get on that front foot. And again, I suppose a lot of it's to try and build confidence as well. If we can get the likes of Clarkson and and McGrath and uh, Duke sort of having intricate little um, sort of player in the box and taking on their man, that would that would suit me. Yeah, I guess the hope, of course, is of course that those players that are still away on international duty, you mentioned Connor Barron, Jamie McGrath, Boyan Miowski, of course, we talked about earlier, come back fully fit because, of course, we're doing this on Monday night, so there are still a couple of games to play for for some of these players as well. So, you know, we've got to we've got to keep the faith that everybody comes back fully fit, raring to go um, at, at the weekend. I, I totally agree, though, about you know the, the taking the game to, to to Ross County because it's a game where. I think for the crowd's sake as well, we can't afford to be about the half hour mark nil nil of stray passes, missed chances, nervy at the back, because that then filters into the crowd. And I'm sure as much as the Red Shed and, and the rest of the, the stands at Pataudry will continue to be behind the team throughout, um, there will be the occasion if there's a loose pass or cheap possession giveaway that moans and groans will start. And the longer that game goes on at nil nil, the louder those groans arguably get. And I just wonder, <clears throat> as much as we speak about Aberdeen wanting to start the game on the front foot and positively, what do you think Don Cowie's approach is to this? Sit in and frustrate or look to come out and maybe hit us on a bit on the counter attack early on? See, it's tough because they've got a couple of quality players going forward. And mm-hmm. I think that's where they're slightly different to what they were potentially sort of last season um, under Alki Mackay, you know, they're not just relying on Jordan White winning knockdowns and, and hoping somebody's going to be there, you know, they've got um, got like Simon Murray um, who I think scored a couple goals um, in recent games. Yeah, um, so even Brophy as well. Quick, yeah, and he obviously quick forward as well for getting him behind. Jan Danda, obviously he's he's on his way at Hearts, um, you know, he can sort of really pull the strings in the middle for them. But I'm, I'm, I'm tending to think, and I think it's just going off of what they tend to do when they come to Tawdry, mm-hmm. is I can see it being a sit-in. And I think it's because, you know, like, like you described, they know what the atmosphere is like. If they can sit in, and the longer it stays at nil-nil, the more that that's sort of in their favour, um, and the more likely it is that the frustration is going to seep into the Aberdeen team and they're going to start forcing things, and that's when they're going to get their opportunities um, to hit us on the break. So... Yeah, I can see them see it being a little bit of a sticky game as it as it oftentimes is. <clears throat> and speaking just there about Eamon Brophy and Simon Mur- Murray, when you say defenders are quick for getting in behind, I suddenly got PTSD to the St Johnston game and their long balls over the top of Stefan Garteman. And obviously that is a big weak point of, of his game that we've seen so far. I just wonder if that's something that county potentially look if they'd look to sit in and frustrate. They know, you know, Angus McDonald hasn't exactly proved himself to be the quickest in terms of turning and getting back either. Stefan's not exactly covered himself in glory all the time as well. Could that be an exploit? Jan Dandek, very creative player, quality in terms of what he can provide. 
they've got that little bit of pace. That's certainly, I'm sure, something that County will be be looking to exploit. Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely. I mean, even looking at Roos and Goal, I mean, mm. you know, a few seasons ago, County, I think, probably had the most, maybe other than Livy, probably the most set piece goals. Um, and you know, if they do what St Johnson did and target, you know, target somebody onto Roos um, to sort of pin them on his line, not that he really needs to be pinned anyway. Um, <laughs> But, you know, if, if, they, if they kind of, like you say, exploit the, the sort of lack of pace we've got um, with McDonald and the sort of erratic nature of Gartman at times and then pairing that in with, with the Roos's reluctance to sort of command his box, um, even if they are sounding like Sir Jordan White up front, it could be um, a little bit of a long afternoon for the, the sort of spine of that team. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, though, from an Aberdeen point of view, you know, as much as our defence is maybe dodgy, we've got players that, have quality we've just yet to see it on a consistent basis as I said I think it, that goal uh, against Motherwell will do Leighton Clarks in the world of good um, Junior Hoylett not involved with, with Canada so has had a chance to stay in, and train and, and maybe get a bit more familiar a player that possesses a lot of quality for me personally I would like to see on, on set pieces a lot more certainly from corners um, let's see what, what he can bring um, I'd also be tempted to start Duke as well um, personally just with the, the directness and I think that phys- physicality and pace that he can bring um, c- could potentially disrupt County in, in the early stages and then you bring on your more technical players at, at the end because sometimes I think this season when we've thrown on Duke when the game's nil-nil it's not really suited his style whereas when he first joined us that was suiting him. It, it's unfortunately for one reason or another not this season. So I'd be tempted to, to start him. Um, I wonder as well, a player that's not been getting many minutes recently as well, depending of course on the, the fitness of some of those involved in international football, could we see Dante Polvaro um, feature from, from the start as you mentioned as well, a player being made for big games this season? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I'd like to see Polvaro going in Um like I said, I think Barron's been a little bit sort of off the ball a little bit um, in the past few games. Um, and I think Povara shows up. I mean, especially, like I say, if we're going to be, if we do look to start um, Hoylet and Duke, um, Povara showed himself to be quite a good sort of deep lion playmaker. You know, he likes to play mm-hmm. that ball in the channel quite often. Um, so I think if that's the way we're going, I would, I would much prefer to see Povara. And it also gives us that bit more physicality in the middle as well. I sometimes find, or even at times against Motherwell, because the likes like Theo Barry, you know, he's quite a big lad. Mm. Um, if the ball was pinged up to the halfway line, you know, Barron and even sometimes Shinny sort of struggled with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so like having that that added sort of height in there can somewhat nullify it slightly. Um, but no, I'm, I'm with you in the fact I'd like to see Hoylet playing. Um, I think I put, put something up the other week um, saying that he's probably the best crosser of the ball we've got. And um, mm-hmm. some of the balls he plays into the box are wicked. We just. I think, you know, it's probably just the, a timing aspect of um, not being familiar with, with the yeah. sort of runs that Miofsky and that's playing. But, I mean, some of his balls are, are bang on the money um, and he just needs someone there to pick them out. Um, so, yeah, hopefully see see him getting a run out from the start as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, with, with both Duke and, and Junior Hoylet, they they provide a lot of directness. And you look back to the, the St Mirren game, that, that first hour, how, how threatening both of them looked down the wing and some of the, the play we had in, in that, that game. We just won't speak about the, the, the last half hour. Um, they can hurt teams, and with the greatest respect to Ross County, St Mirren are of a higher quality than, than Ross County this season. So you'd like to think we could we could exploit that, and I'm just hoping that this is the game that, that Boyan gets back onto the, the goal trail as well, because of course we've got big games coming up every game feels like a big game just now in fairness um and i think for his confidence going into the 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 running if you want to call it that um not only will be aided of course by his international goal as we said but will be be helped if he, he gets on the score sheet domestically too oh definitely um like i like i said i, think, I mean him and duke the, the pair of them i think you would probably describe as confident strikers and um, mm-hmm. you know when they're when they're on on for when they're you know, feeling like they can do anything. It, it, you almost expect them to score from anywhere within thirty yards of the goal. Um, mm. So I think it's try to get if we can get both them firing. Um, you know, we'll be fine going into the tail end of the season. It's the the longer the pain of their goal drought goes on. 
and we're not really producing goals from elsewhere, it, it gets a little bit nervy. Yeah. One final thing then, Phil, before we wrap up the episode. Does three points on Saturday end all relegation chat? No, because it's us, and I don't feel confident enough to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know what we can be like over the years. Um, so no, I think it, I think it makes it more comfortable, and I think hopefully that eases the players a little bit, um, mm. and sort of makes them feel like there's that little bit of buffer um, to sort of kick on a little bit. Um, obviously, Livy's for, for the most part a write off. I can't mm. see them. That they, I just don't see them having the quality in their squad to to change anything. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, like like we're saying, but this weekend being important is County. That's the worry. Yeah. Um, I think so, it's also yeah. funny. I think you know it got mentioned on uh, a couple of episodes ago that of course nobody's speaking about St Johnson who have fallen into there mm-hmm. uh, as well. So I guess maybe one to keep an eye on. Of course, if we win, if St Johnson failed to win this weekend, then it you know it could be them that Ross County target and. And not us because you know there's two teams quite quite close to them. But I, I probably do agree with you that not quite yet. Um, yeah, it's, to, it's, it's, it's the Aberdonian. It's Aberdonian. Yeah. Smith, it's Glen. That's a problem. Yeah, what what a place to leave it uh, on, Phil. Thank you very much for once again ably stepping into the co-host chair. The rest of these episodes between now and the end of the season will continue on a Monday night um, at seven because it is such a, a popular slot um, here and so many of you do continue to tune in. It does mean that Callum uh, is unlikely to be here um, on a Monday night due to his working working schedule, so he'll only make the, the midweek games. So between Phil and possibly Jay and anybody else that wants to step up into that, that co-host chair, they'll be ably joining me between now um, and the end of the season. But thank you very much, Phil, for joining in on this episode, and thank you very much to those of you that have tuned in live here on YouTube. Remember to like the video, subscribe if you haven't done so, and follow on audio.